All right, I hope everyone enjoyed their break. Um, next up, we have Jonathan Gray, who's going to give us some updates on CN environment automation. Uh, take it away, John. Thanks. So first off, uh, my name is Jonathan Gray. I've been with the Comcast CDN team now for just over four years. Um, but I've been kind of floating around the technology industry itself now for over 12, I think. So uh, today you're kind of getting a two for one special on talks. Um, if you've heard me speak in the past, uh, the last two years, I've talked about environment automation. Uh, and today we're gonna first talk about kind of what's new and what's changed in the last year. So first off, as far as code that has been committed to the head of the Apache Traffic Control Repository, we've got 11 committers this year. Uh, most of which are new. Uh, if you'd like to review more details, there's actually kind of some, the commands that I used are down in the small print. Um, there have been several significant features added as well as some general maintenance um, that we've uh, taken care of this year. First off, uh, we've gone through and with a lot alongside of the traffic control project itself, we've added support for installation of Postgres versions over 9.6. Uh, so if you want to install 10, 12, 13, which is the current recommendation, uh, and leverage the Ansible roles that are in the repository, uh, you're welcome to do that. Now I will also, for those of you that haven't um, heard me in the past, a lot of the code in the areas that I work in isn't in the actual product for the CDN itself, not the application layer, but rather all the stuff around it. And also um, the code and the features that I'm referencing here are by no means required. If you have your own mechanism for doing things, happy for you, um, keep going. But if you don't have anything, uh, we do have some options available to you. As far as next um, bigger, bigger features go, um, we did have a major performance improvement in the data set loader role that takes care of uh, getting going from the definition of environment to a valid traffic ops database. We've also, uh, alongside of the project, converted the defaults for traffic vault from using RIAC to using Postgres in accordance with the new ATC6 release, which is coming up soon. We've also added the uh, testing capabilities for federations as well. Uh, if you're using federations in your environment and you want to test that out, um, that's part of what you get for free now. Maintenance um, changes that we had are things like making sure we stay in, in sync with um, configuration options, as well as other um, project changes like the conversion from the ORT package to T3C, as well as um, with the death of Perl, uh, there is no longer a general web host available um, as part of the ATC stack. And so now we've broken that apart so that you can supply whatever arbitrary web server you have for certain static file content like the CZF that Zach mentioned this morning. We also do have um, some significant improvements when it comes to our API usage as well. So we've made the jump from the Traffic Ops API 1.3 to 2.0. And that is in conjunction with the ATC6 release, wherein all of the 1.x API versions are going away. Um, and granted, 2.0 is going to be deprecated um, to begin with um, in ATC release 6. However, um, we are still working on getting it to the 3.0 release, um, which we hope to have sometime in the near future. Now, uh, you've also heard me talk a bit in the past about my particular refactor work that I've been doing. Um, this has been a branch that has lived way too long and I really do need to get it merged back. Um, I'm kind of doing some stabilization testing at this point, but there have been several areas that have been um, enhanced over the course of the time. And I do periodically sync that up with the head of the Apache Traffic Control Project. Um, and you're welcome to use these things today if you like uh, as part of your weaving of source code when it comes to environment creation. Uh, you're welcome to rope these versions of the Ansible roles in if you'd like. Now, when it comes to ATS, this has been one of the 
main areas of focus. Um, in addition to making sure that uh, doing rebuilds don't accidentally have corrupted base states, we do make sure that we, uh, by default, clear out any previous information that ATS boxes might have had. That's both doing it gracefully by asking ATS nicely and forcefully with DD. Uh, we've also put a lot of effort into the profile and parameter templatization for ATS, namely as part of adding support for ATS 8 in the initial version. Um, we went ahead and I realized that the way we have been doing it traditionally of just having one big flat list for edges and then another flat list for mids, um, as more versions of ATS start to show up, that is a lot of YAML code. And so as a consequence, I went through and wrote some new tooling so that um, we can better maintain that going forward. So things like removing assertions of values that already existed um, as the defaults in ATS, as well as denorm or, excuse me, normalizing the data itself so that we uh, make sure that we don't duplicate things as much as we can. So, what does that mean? Uh, it means that for the combined profile parameter templates for ATS 7 and 8 for both edges and mids, it means that we've cut the size of that code by about 90% roughly. So that should help with maintenance going forward and making things a bit more clear as to which things apply in what circumstances. Now we've also gone through and added support for dynamic profiles uh, when it comes to ATS by hardware variants. Suppose, for example, you have a Dell R640 that has 12 drives and another 640 that has 24 drives. Well, in ATS profiles, that turns out to be two different ones because of the fact that we model storage.config, which has to do with the assignment of disks. So as a consequence, um, we go ahead and hit up a few basic system statistics um, during that initial profile creation and make sure we delineate those appropriately. The next area that we've uh, kind of gone through some major work with is the dataset loader itself. Uh, the biggest thing that came out of that this past year was the performance enhancements that shaved about, um, about an hour or two off the runtime, I believe. And those were significant enough that I went ahead and backported those into an official PR into the uh, Apache Traffic Control Project directly uh, so that people could leverage that immediately um, as it was a small and safe change. We've also generally gone through and done some code cleanup as well so that things are less awkward. Um, manipulating data is not Ansible's forte. So, uh, We've gone through and done some work to actually convert some sections to Python directly so that that way uh, it's less awkward to read through and keep track of and more intuitive to navigate how it does what it does. There are also now per component server defaults. So things like, for example, traffic ops, um, when you pull up a server for ATS, you're going to have your HTTPS ports set to 443. But for example, on an influx DB, you might have an HTTP port of 8080, um, or excuse me, 8086. And so those things, uh, instead of being one, one value to rule them all or forcing you to be more explicit on every single instance um, in your inventory definitions during your provisioning layers, um, this allows you to be a little bit more hands-off and correct answers by default on the various components. The next area of significant improvement um, that I've uh, set up is with Traffic Ops Database or Postgres. So out of the box now we support IPv6 and there's also now support for more than one uh, Traffic Ops Database host. So now instead of having one Postgres instance, you now have, can have an arbitrary number of them arranged into, a, into three tiers so that you have a primary, a standby and some number of replicas underneath that standby so that you can do better testing around things like HA failovers and uh, making sure that you do set up um, a more production-like situation if you're 
in that position. Uh, now, when it comes to TODB and Postgres, I'm not saying you must use um, the role that is part of the Apache Traffic Control Repository because it is just Postgres, so there are lots of people that have done that. Um, the role that is included is simply tuned to automatically take care of some of the quirks and preconditions of Traffic Ops itself. So um, if someone else has done it better, absolutely feel free to make use of it if you so choose. There are many available in the Ansible Galaxy or GitHub in general. As far as miscellaneous fixes go, um, again, continuing to expand configuration options that haven't been there before, specifically around Let's Encrypt for Traffic Ops, so that that way you can connect up your uh, SSL certificate generation as part of delivery service creation to Let's Encrypt. Now, I'm, I'm saying these things because this is only in the configuration support via Ansible. It's been in the project itself now for quite some time. Um, I believe it was actually presented at last year's ApacheCon uh, in the content track. There have also been some general improvements to the default values used in Traffic Portal and just across the board general improvements in terms of bug fixes and performance improvements. Um, now, the last thing here uh, that I've gone through and done is I spent some time working on testing. Uh, when it comes to Ansible code, Testing is kind of an Achilles heel because it's a little strange, right? Ansible being the language of operations. What does testing of operational code look like? It's not something you can connect up normal programming philosophies of unit testing to or um, certain uh, functional testing. So uh, what does it mean when you're not talking about an application any longer, but rather all the stuff around an application, the operating systems, the um, application installation aspects, those sorts of things. So this is where the Molecule project comes in. The Molecule project is one of the generally um, more popular mechanisms by which you can do testing of, of Ansible code. It is focused primarily around the use of roles, um, just like what we have in our Apache Traffic Control repository. For those of you not familiar with Ansible as a whole, um, the Roles are kind of analogous in normal programming terms to functions, so that you give some number of parameters in, it does some stuff and comes back. Um, so Molecule itself is just a framework that has uh, certain capabilities around provisioning and testing. Now those provisioning aspects are pluggable so that you can use Whatever arbitrary cloud provider you might be using, there are already um, open source plugins for uh, Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure. But by default, it does use Docker or Podman out of the box. It is all driven by Ansible. So that's one of the big things, too, is that you're leveraging common skill sets you already have. So building out the molecule definition for what you want is still YAML, and all of the testing that you do is in fact playbooks that you're already familiar with writing. You do have hooks for linters as well, just like normal programming um, languages, where you, in you can do basic sanity checks on things like YAML, making sure that you have properly set up um, all of your formatting and white space correctly. And then Ansible Lint as well, as kind of a best practices guide for things like variable naming conventions, et cetera. The, Testing assertions that are supported by Molecule are things that you could write with Ansible. So things like um, making sure that ports are open after an application installation, making sure certain API requests might function the way you expect, um, making sure that certain files exist in certain places, those sorts of things. Now, there's also a built-in phase to test idempotency, which is a big component of infrastructure automation and configuration management in general. Idempotency is the idea that if you run something twice, the second time it doesn't do anything. It tracks what things have to change independent of um, did it actually do them. So um, idempotency is one of those things in Ansible and in most other configuration management tools that is a common trend for keeping tabs on to make sure that you're only changing what you mean to change and keeping track of that easier. 
Now, the life cycle of a molecule run is a little different than we've talked about in the past, right? In the past, when I've given presentations on environment construction, we focused on a per environment level, um, three layer cake, more or less, of trying to go through the process of constructing labs. At the very bottom being provisioning layers of going from nothingness to somethingness, and from a steady state layer, going from a generic vanilla operating system to something that's more specialized for your environment. And then lastly, specializing each of those instances to whatever function in life they're destined to be. Molecule has very similar phases, but they're actually additional ones. Now, these are not, strictly speaking, all required. The first off um, case here being the linter phase, uh, you can choose to run if you wish, and it just runs whatever hooks you've provided. Now, in my case, I've already wired up both Ansible Lint and YAML Lint, so it, it takes care of running both of those for me. Now, these to try and help protect you from accidental changes, since those commands are arbitrary, it does copy your code off of the side so that you don't accidentally um, correct, corrupt your working copies when it's doing those linting processes, um, in case you've accidentally turned on the features to autocorrect, for example. The, um, after that, you basically end up in what's called a scenario. A scenario is some combination of definition of infrastructure, code, process, definition of how you do what you do. Now, because these are focused on a per role level, for example, traffic ops database we've mentioned before um, being uh, a, a good example, you can have more than one scenario. Now, for us, we've gone ahead now and created two scenarios, one for when you have a single host by itself, and also when you have a triad of hosts operating in waterfall. That way I can make sure that the code does what it's supposed to do and functions as it's supposed to um, throughout the process in both uh, setups. There, within a scenario, there are several different phases. First of all, dependencies. If you're a Ansible developer and you don't work on normal traffic ops or traffic control code, very often you might not have RPMs, for example. So making sure those things exist. And those run locally on your system. Uh, it also handles important things like generating secrets for you. Um, rather than having them checked into the repository. And then after that, it goes through a testing phase for syntax. Now, this is only a very simplistic syntax check. It is not by any stretch of the imagination exhaustive of will all of this do what I think it should do at the end of the, at the, end of the road. Um, it's just making sure there's a basic sanity check there. Now, when it goes through the creation phase, that's where we talk about those pluggable provisioning layers. That's where Docker and Podman come into example uh, by default. Making sure that those instances are stood up the way you want them to be stood up um, in whatever arrangements or number you need. Then you have a prepare phase where you can reach inside of each of those new instances and do whatever base layer configuration you might need to do. So if that's something like setting up users or package repositories, um, or even installing components that are preconditions that you already have vetted in some way that are out of the scope of the role you're trying to test, but are also preconditions for it. So for example, if I'm testing traffic ops, I kind of have to have traffic, traffic ops DB underneath it already set up and ready to go. So the prepare phase can be um, pretty significantly different um, based on what you're testing and uh, is on a per instance level before you get to your main goal. So the converge phase is what we would normally think of our goal for testing. It is the, the, the role that you're targeting. So if I'm targeting traffic ops, for example, this would be the traffic ops role um, convergence or playbook that describes what all the steps are to uh, install traffic ops. Now, the good thing is that because these are roles, right, um, what actually goes inside that converge phase is pretty light. Um, for the most part, it's going to be more or less simply an include role statement with some number of parameters defined, because all the magic and all the hard work is actually done inside the role itself that you're including. So the converge roles are generally pretty lightweight. There is an idipotence phase as well at the end, so, uh, or rather next, so that it runs it again to make sure that, again, you check for that idipotence. And if you have things that change, even though you didn't change your inputs at all, then that means you have a non-idipotent change somewhere in the mix that you need to address. 
There is an optional side effect phase as well. So if you need to enter in something like um, you want to run your testing in a mode wherein the primary Postgres instance underneath Traffic Ops has failed for some reason, you can produce those sorts of side effects. The verify phase itself is a playbook that just says, go try and do these sorts of things like open connections on sockets, um, assert certain data points from whatever deeper inspection into the system you might need to have, make sure API calls do what they're supposed to do, those sorts of things. And then lastly, clean up after yourself. So make sure you destroy all your instances or cloud resources as you so choose. You're not required to go through all of these phases. Uh, this is just the exhaustive list of, of the full life cycle. If you choose um, for uh, doing local development, for example, um, you can simply say, you know what, stop after you've done the create phase because all I want is just the infrastructure. I don't want it specialized in any particular way. Um, or stop after the converge phase. You know, when you've done the work you're supposed to do and you're in a good state, um, as far as you believe, go ahead and stop there. And then I can go off and do whatever I want um, on my resources in my environment that way. Um, next, um, getting these first couple of roles off the ground. This Now I will go ahead and say this is not for everything um, in all of the roles for all the components. This is right now only for Traffic Ops DB and the fake origin. Um, but in doing so, I wanted to make sure that I took care of some of the lower level plumbing pieces. So things like making sure that there already is a shared set of uh, linter configs set up that are reasonable and sane, as well as making sure that things like RPMs exist, PKI works, um, and that we work through how does, how does secret management work. So for example, with secret management, uh, secret management, when you're first starting up a system, it checks for the existence of a secrets file, and if that file exists, then uh, it loads it as variables. If you need something um, that doesn't exist in there, it will go ahead and generate for you that arbitrary random password of 32 characters of letters, numbers, symbols, et cetera, and then write it out to that same file. So that that way, when your environment is stood up and ready to go, the logins are gonna to be totally scrambled and you won't know what they are. So you can simply pull up that file and read the values out in plain text so that that way you know how to log in. This kind of adheres to best practices for get of keeping secrets out of the repository. So uh, it does persist as well, so that um, in PKI as well, so that if you, uh, for example, add trusts in your browser for the root CAs that are generated, you can destroy and rebuild your environments as much as you like, and the root CAs themselves won't change. Uh, likewise, if you're tearing down and standing back up the same environment over and over and over again, uh, your secrets themselves won't change until you have cleared that local cache. Speaking of which, uh, when Molecule does start up, there is a directory that does get shared among all the resources, and that is part of where we stash all of our RPMs. And one of the systems that's created is automatically set up as an RPM uh, host so that there's a way for you to simply drop in RPMs and say yum upgrade if you really want to. And kind of lastly here, uh, we've gone ahead and done the, I've done the work to get it wired up to GitHub Actions. I mean, testing is great, but if you don't actually run your test, then they atrophy. So uh, I've, gone, I've gone ahead and added them up to, the, to my branch, um, the refactor branch I've been talking about here to GitHub Actions so that that way um, basic things like linters are enforced and different scenarios might be enforced. Now, you, again, you don't have to go to the full extent of checking every single thing um, just to get a little bit in place. So you can do all the linters first and not have to worry about the rest um, if so chosen. Now, because we're using GitHub Actions, that does give us access to the strategy matrix um, or matrix strategy rather, um, options that are available when running GitHub Actions so that you can then pass in variables that define your environment um, as well too. So for example, when I'm running my tests um, on the roles that I have, I'm automatically running them on both CentOS 7 and CentOS 8. Or if I have multiple scenarios like with Traffic Ops DB, I'm running both uh, single host and triad host scenarios. So that that way, um, 
when I make a change to Traffic Ops DB, for example, that's running a total of four separate invocations of four separate environments with four separate preconditions and destinations of what it should look like and behave like at the end. So that, that way we can catch things earlier in the process prior to the PRs getting merged. Now that's kind of the end of the first section of this talk and moving on kind of the second piece here, we're talking a little bit more about how we manage operating systems at scale. Now, when you get into the realm of having to manage thousands of operating systems, there are some limits when it comes to uh, how much you can invest and maintain actively, just because if you're having to reach inside of each system and maintain it by hand, um, that can get burdensome. So this is also where, again, common tooling and common skill sets, we leveraged Ansible um, here at Comcast. And part of the reasonings, I mean, there are lots of reasons why, and it's not the only option. There are many other good solutions out there. Um, but in our case, we chose uh, to move this direction because of the, the fact that it was mature, that it could coexist with other solutions, that it had a simpler learning curve, and that it was something that we could scale both in a centralized and decentralized fashion. Now, when I say centralized and decentralized, you've seen the slide in previous uh, last year's presentation. There are two typical workflows when it comes to Ansible code. By default, what most people think of is Ansible push, wherein you define some control host like your local laptop, for example, and it pushes specific commands to specific systems in a specific order so that um, each system only does what it's being told and never has to question what else is available for it to be doing. So do this, more or less. And then um, there is another mechanism that we leverage for steady state enforcement, being Ansible pull. And in this mode, you're inverting the model. Instead of having a control host, every system autonomously wakes up and enforces state. It enforces a given um, set of configuration across the footprint. So instead of saying do this, you're saying each system do what applies to you. Now this is something that uh, does not require, strictly speaking, large amounts of infrastructure to get going. If you already have a Git repository out there, um, you can continue to leverage it. And Git also scales very well, so if you need um, if you do hit the point where you have thousands of systems phoning home every couple of minutes asking for new changes, well, that is something you might consider doing something like adding more web servers with load balancers in front um, when you need it, not necessarily before. This also means that because it's Git, you can leverage all of the Git management tools that you already have. Um, like if you're already using GitHub or GitHub Enterprise or GitLab, for example, um, you can continue using those as your base. Now, when it comes to Ansible pull, um, I was looking through and saying, well, I want to show, you know, kind of what does the anatomy of an Ansible pull repository look like? And when I was looking around, somebody else had already actually done a pretty decent job of it. So this is where I diverge from my prepared remarks. The um, there is an example repository out there in GitHub today if you want to use it. It's a very basic repository. It doesn't do a whole lot, but it does give you a good example to kind of work from. And the author of this particular repository does go into some pretty reasonable details as to some of the gotchas that you're going to run into. Simply getting it set up and doing its thing to begin with is something as simple as running a single command to say, hey, Ansible pull, go fetch this repository and run whatever it tells you. And by the way, this is who I am. When we talk about um, things like coexistence, for example, in your if you're using Ansible push, you may have some system level config that defines how Ansible is going to function, but you're also allowed to have in Ansible pull a version checked in that takes precedence. So that if you need, for example, the hash behavior under normal circumstances to be different than what Ansible pull should be using, then you have that as something that can be set specifically in that circumstance. Now from there, now this is not an example that would scale very high, but it does show you some basics to get off the ground, wherein each system is defined as a separate YAML file, which defines host vars, uh, in this case called pull groups with 
what groups to which it belongs. So my group versus only bar uh, for the example bar.example.com. Ansible pull, when it runs, uh, does invoke the normal Ansible inventory functions. So the in this case, um, the author used a Python script which adhered to the standard calling conventions for binaries and output formats for binaries so that then it could take in those YAML files that we just looked at and produce something that is more um, understandable natively inside of Ansible. So you have real groups you can work with and the host that you're running this on individually understands what groups to which it belongs. Now, once Ansible understands the groups to which this particular host that's running this repository belongs, there is an entry point playbook. That playbook does very specific things um, as defined. Now, you can see here there are four separate plays um, for basic things like hello world for my group versus only foo versus only bar. So that, for example, this play would be skipped when running on bar.example.com, um, but these other three would. Now, the only constant here that you're going to see that actually is somewhat useful is the configuration of Ansible pull itself. So uh, in this case, you can the this particular repository goes ahead and sets up some very rudimentary um, system D configurations to effectively run that Ansible pull command on a, on a regular cadence, setting up that basic enforcement. So the the roles that are um, built um, are, again, analogous to functions. And that's typically an Ansible pull what you're going to be using are some form of role, which also dovetails very nicely into the discussion we just had about how Molecule can be used to test roles to make sure that they do the things they're supposed to do. So you can um, connect up Molecule to your roles to test them, to then leverage them in Ansible pull, just like you would leverage them in deploying lab environments via Ansible push. So that is more or less um, kind of everything Ansible pull in a nutshell here. It's a very basic repository. Um, it does not have all of the bells and whistles, but it does kind of give you somewhere basic to start with so that um, it's easy to get off the ground. Continuing on. Um, the first thing that when we talk about um, how would you modify that base template would be that inventory file. How do you know who you are? Um, now, in their case, they use flat XML files, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, but when it comes to more higher scale, that's where you can leverage those scripts like they did in the repository. Uh, there actually is an existing dynamic inventory script that's part of the Apache Traffic Control Repository, which can be leveraged to produce very similar effect based on traffic ops as the source of truth. Next, as far as significant enhancements, these are things we've done in Comcast that um, we do recommend you think about in your um, deployments of Ansible pull. So one of the big things that we've done is making is realizing that Ansible pull can take time. It, it uh, depending on how much state you're enforcing, you are able to uh, work, work through some things that are more uh, immediate that must always be true versus things that are only true when things change. So you can separate the triggers out um, and have separate triggering conditions for Ansible pull. So you can separate full runs versus um, fast runs uh, of different smaller scopes um, based on things like reboot, whether something failed, or whether or not the repository is in some way different um, on this run versus the last. Five, now, because, five, minute, five minute warning, Jonathan. Cool, okay. Um, lots of different things you can do here. Um, one of the big things there is multi-branch support as well, so that that way you can define um, basic um, definitions of what branches exist. The Because you can define what branches Ansible pull might be using, it allows you to uh, adopt GitOps strategies um, like you might have seen in other situations, wherein different hosts can be definitions, uh, can be set up in different um, environments. So you can use uh, pre-production um, to get your changes first, then you roll forward into Canary or small blast radius of production 
and then graduate those changes into normal production. Now, because you can leverage GitOps strategies here and it's just Git, that allows you to use whatever um, governance tools around who can commit and what are the requirements for merging, things like have your test passed, have you had peer reviews, those sorts of things. I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to talk about security. So when it comes to security, you can have um, all the basic security features of Git to start with. So you can leverage um, HTTP, HTTPS, or SSH transport layers to obtain your uh, file or re obtain your Ansible pull repository with all of the normal bells and whistles that you can configure for things like access controls. Um, whether you're doing SSH keys, whether you're doing usernames and passwords, whatnot, um, you can choose to extend the connectivity however you wish. Um, we've already mentioned the requirements for merging um, when you're leveraging multiple branches in Ansible pull. Ansible pull also supports the leveraging of signed commits so that um, authorship can't be forged. So if you want to require that GPG key signing be a thing um, on all of your commits, that is a thing you can enforce. Uh, likewise, if you want to make sure somebody hasn't come along and made local edits um, behind your back on a given box, you can perform force checkouts. Now, I actually recommend this in general because um, things like rebase, for example, or force pushes can change um, what those requirements are. Uh, and also, if you're going to leverage multiple branches with a wrapper script, that allows you to have a policy or governance layer as you so choose around governing which boxes belong where. Have that map somewhere out of scope defined. The second area of security that you'll want to take advantage of or think about significantly is the contents of the repository itself. Things like what is your root password, for example. Now, you can leverage the built-in Ansible vault um, tooling that is built into Ansible, but that is not the greatest of solutions unless you can tightly control all access to the host and the repository and everything in between. Ansible Vault is effectively just running a symmetric um, hash on uh, or creating a symmetric key hashed value and shoving that into the repository. So um, in terms of security, it's almost analogous to um, putting it in in plain text given enough time. So um, Ansible Vault is not the greatest of solutions, but it is there as a built-in option. One of the more recommended standard practices, however, is the use of lookup plugins. And there, these are not all of them, but these are some of them. These lookup plugins allow you to, instead of embedding the credential, like a root password, for example, you can instead leverage a pointer to a password in some other system, um, whether it's a dedicated credential management system like AWS Secret Manager or HashiCorp Vault, or just a general configuration management system like etcd. Um, you can instead leverage pointers, thus keeping the secrets themselves out of your repository. Next would be the concept of logging. When you have a thousand systems running autonomously enforcing state, how do you know when stuff has changed? How do you know things by default is that Ansible pull, if you're using system D, is going to write out standard out like you'd normally see to journal D, which hopefully is being harnessed through whatever um, system uh, security features you're um, talking about there. The augmentation and replacement of callback plugins um, is how you might change that. So instead of you want JUnit files instead of system, instead of JSON or regular standard out, you can change the formatting. You want to change where it goes. You can send it to syslog as opposed to journal D. Or if you have some other third-party logging and analytics tool like Splunk or uh, Foreman, for example, you can have the logs sent directly um, over HTTP to those systems. Now, I hope that you kind of take this um, as uh, kind of the main two things here is, is that we see that the Ansible work as a whole around the project is still um, under active development from uh, multiple folks and continuing to make progress. And likewise, Ansible pull, when you're trying to understand how do I scale out constant state enforcement of, of my system for things like users, passwords, repositories, things that are normally beneath the scope of the Apache Traffic Control project, how do you go about enforcing that thing, uh, enforcing all those things? 
Now, all my contact info is here, so feel free to reach out if you like. Um, I'm running short on time for questions. Um, and looking through these real quick, um, I would say the Ansible code is not simple by any stretch of the, of the imagination, nor is it authoritative and complete, because the roles, while they do handle the heavy lifting of the Apache Traffic Control project, every implementation and every environment will be different. Um, if we used one provisioning layer for things like OpenStack and you leveraged AWS, that's going to be something out of scope of the project itself to maintain. And so only the pieces that are relevant to the project itself are what belong in the project. Um, so there, I would recommend reviewing um, previous um, presentations if you'd like more information along those lines. All right. I think that uh, wraps up in terms of time. Thank you very much, everybody, for showing up today. Um, hope you have a good, uh, good rest of your day.